All right. So some students were having trouble with the project. Uh, they were having trouble with this uh, IR201 and 202, where you're installing these products on a Google Cloud Linux machine and setting up the software and such. And these are probably the harder ones in the class because you have to do this Linux stuff and that's unfamiliar to students. So another thing you might do is forget about them. Now there's a lot of extra credit projects. And if that kind of uh, somewhat sophisticated um, configuring of machines is not your thing, you can skip down here. And in particular, the most important extra credit one is here, Splunk Boss of the Sock. And some students have done this already in my previous classes. But if you haven't done this, you really should. And it is very, very useful. And the one thing about this is you don't have to install anything. You can use my server that's in the cloud. So you connect to my server, and I think I have to use a different browser for it because um, this Brave doesn't like basic authentication. So you go to splunk.samsclass.info, and then you need the username of student one and a password of student one. And now you're in. And this is running Splunk, and it is showing you, um, if you go to search and reporting, that's the main place to be. Yes, yeah, Eproxmox, I don't remember that. Anyway, we'll talk. So here you are in Splunk. And so this has not collecting any new data. It's looking at data that's four years old. But the point of this is this is the kind of data you get from a real enterprise network. These guys set up an enterprise network in the cloud and they attacked it and they monitored it all and they saved the data. This is Splunk set this up so you can learn Splunk. So if you go here, you see there's about a million events. The data summary will show you what kind of events you have. And by default, it sorts them by the name of the server which is not much useful to us. The most useful thing for us is source types. What you're seeing are logs. Here's Windows event logs of various types. Here's Windows registry information. Here's FortiGate firewall logs. Here's IIS, Microsoft's web server. And here are streams, DHCP, DNS, HTTP. Those are records of network traffic. It's not full packet capture like TCB dump or Wireshark. It is a summary of the connections that were made by these protocols, but it's very nice. And so all those types of data are in here and Suricata data is in here. Suricata is an open source intrusion detection system, which you will configure if you do IR 201 and 202. And this, by the way, is how a beginning security analyst works. If you are a security analyst, which is a typical beginning job for an IT, uh, information security person, you'll be up late at night looking at a product like Splunk that is running, and you will not be configuring it or installing anything. It will be installed by so someone else, and you'll just be using it. And that's what this project teaches you to do. So uh, that's an overview of the kinds of data you see in here. And so let's start looking at stuff. Um, so if you put in this index, you can sort your data into indexes in any group, any way you want to. And in this project, all the data is in one index called bots v1, which is boss of the sock version one. And the data is four years old. So you have to go to all time. And if you search, it's going to find all 1 million events, 956,000. And that'll take a long time. So to make it faster, I'm going to just look at one in a thousand of the events. This will skip all but one in one thousandth of the answers, which makes it much faster. Of course, I'm not seeing all the events, but it gives me an idea of what's going on here. So here you see a Win Registry event and a Windows event log and so on. What you see here are the results, and they're always backwards in time. The most recent event first, and then going back. And you can look at the events one by one here. And you can expand them and see all the details of the events. Um, and so this is one way to examine things one by one. But since I have a thousand results, that's not a very efficient way to do it. What's much more effective is to go here and look at selected fields. For example, I have client IP address. If I click on that, there are three IP addresses. Here's the events for that IP address and that and that. Notice it does not add up to a thousand. So this client IP address is not present in every record. And that is the fundamental problem here, which is the same problem Google has. Log entries are not consistent. Each product logs different data and it even uses different names for the same concept. So 
when you're searching for things, really the only difficulty with Splunk is not so much Splunk, it's in the underlying data. When you search for things, you often have to try different versions of the name and uh, it can be confusing. Anyway, so let's look at um, stream HTTP events. So I'm gonna add that here. Now I could do it this way, but I think I'm gonna do it the other way. I'm gonna go to source type here. And you see here's the various source types and here is stream HTTP. So if I click on that, it will automatically add it. Now I could type the query up here, but I'd have to get the syntax right. If I use the mouse and pick off menus, then I don't have to spell things right. So now I'm getting the HTTP traffic and there's only 17 events. So I'm gonna look at more of them. I'm gonna go from sampling one in a thousand to go to sampling one in a hundred. So I see a few more of them and I'm gonna go into list instead of table view, which I think will show me, yeah, this is the way I normally like to see it. This lays out the data so it's a little easier for me to read. So these are HTTP requests and responses. And so if you look at this one, here's the client IP, and here's the content, looks like some kind of uh, error message. That was the page that was returned a 404 error. And if I go down here, here's the destination headers. And here is the request, get MTHR. Let's see, I make this a little bigger. All right, get MTHR.jpg. This is fetching some image and it didn't find it. If I go down here further, um, here I find another one. All right, and so anyway, that's the, um, these are the HTTP requests and responses on my network. And that's fine. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to look for the ones for my web server. And the web server is called I'm really not Batman.com. That's the fake name of the company they used when they generated this data. So I can add that to the query. Now, the most efficient way to use Splunk is to make queries like this, where you have field equals value. That will be fast. You can also just put in a word the way you would in Google. If I put in that word, I'm really not Batman.com, then it's going to look for that word anywhere in the log data. Each log data is just a line of text. And this is what grep would have done. It just looks for that in there. Now, the Splunk experts don't like to search this way because it takes more CPU time, but it works. And I do it all the time because I just care about getting the answer and I'm not really worried about wasting some processor time. So this is going to look for HTTP data that includes the name of our server. So that means it's requests going to my server to see my web page, unless that string would happen by accident, and that's not very likely. So here's a request going to I'm really not Batman.com, Joomla index, and so on. So apparently our server is running Joomla. And if you look at it, you can see that this is the post request. It posted something to my Joomla server, and look at these fields in the request, Acunetics product. Acunetics is a commercial vulnerability scanner. This is not a real customer viewing the website shopping or something. This is an attacker scanning us with a vulnerability scanner and they have been so careless as to use a commercial scanner and not even configure it to hide that it's a commercial scanner. So they are blatantly advertising that they're attacking us. And I know the source IP here, which is the attacker's IP address, and the destination IP is the web server, of course. So that's up here. Here's the web server's IP address. So I'm going to copy that. We're going to need it in a minute. And now we found the first several flags here. Um, the scanner name is there. It was Acunetics. The attacker's IP and the web server's IP is there. And now I'd like to find the defacement file name. And this is what I wanted to show you because it fits into that diagram in the lecture about controlling your network traffic. Um, so if I look at my traffic. It's all going to the web server if it comes in with that name. Now, I mentioned before, the web server should not be able to browse the web. You're not supposed to take a server and open Internet Explorer and go to the internet and look at things. There's two reasons for that. In the first place, you shouldn't be downloading files directly onto a server. You should be downloading them somewhere else, scanning them for virus and moving them over with a network share or a USB stick or something. 
Um, and the other reason, which is probably more important, when attackers attack your server and they gain the ability to execute code on your server, they will try to phone home to a command and control server and you should not allow that. So your server should never be allowed to make any requests going out. It should only be responding to requests coming in. Therefore, this makes it harder for attackers to steal your stuff. They cannot make a direct connection from the server to their command and control server. They have to wander through your network to find some way out. And so we should not find any HTTP requests coming from this server. So here's the IP address. I've copied it. So let's go here. If we looked at this before, the client IP address is the source. So if I look at this, there's a bunch of requests coming from this 40 address, that's the attacker, and there's none coming from the web server itself. So I'm going to click on 40 just to get the syntax right. Now I have where the client IP goes up here. Now I'm going to paste in the web server's IP address. And when I search this way, I'm looking for traffic that goes backwards, where the web server goes to the internet as a client. This should never happen. Now, when I search, I find none of them, but there's two reasons why I'm finding none of them. For one thing, I've still got sampling turned on. And for another thing, I've still got the domain name of the web server in here. And if the web server were to open a browser and go out to the internet, it wouldn't be going to our website. So I have to get rid of that domain name and I have to get rid of the sampling because there's probably not gonna be a large number of these events. And now when I search this way, I find a small number of events, nine events. There are nine events that went backwards through my network doing something that a properly secure network would never allow, where the server acted as a client. So these are highly suspicious events, and there's only nine of them, so you can examine them just by scrolling and reading them. And so here's some event with a lot of Unicode. That's sort of annoying and hard to read. I'll just skip over that one. And then here's a normal looking event going the wrong way. And look at this, it's getting a JPEG image with a suspicious name. That is the defacement file name that was used to deface the web server. And here it's going to a strange looking domain name on a strange port. So this is very suspicious. This is the attacker who somehow gained the ability to execute code on my server. And then they connected to a staging server to download stuff they had put there to deface my web page. So this is again, several flags um, what domain they connected to, um, what the name of the used image they used to deface my server was, and so on. So that gets you started here, and you can see how powerful Splunk is. With just a few simple techniques, you can quickly find a suspicious thing, like the traffic that goes backwards. And so there's just a lot of flags here to find, and you can uh, catch green images and put these in as usual. And there's really an awful lot of it to be done. So if you go down here, there's a brute force attack where they break into the administration panel of the server by trying hundreds of passwords and you can find it. And there's a, they uploaded an executable file and ran it on the server. Um, you can use, um, you find the precise time interval it took them to do the brute force attack and the time interval between the time the brute force automated software found the correct password and the uh, manual connection came in later from the attacker using it. And then there's a ransomware attack. Someone put in an infected USB stick, it infected a server with ransomware, it began encrypting files, and you can see the whole process here. You can see the, um, sought the, you can see the source code of the script that ran, you can see the file creation change events in the Windows logs as it changes the file names to an evil file. You can see the request to the ransom note server that pops up the box that says you now have to pay Bitcoins and so on. So this is why people pay tons of money for Splunk and why they hire people who know how to use Splunk because this is very valuable. You learn how to find all these important security things and Splunk is very nice. It's pretty easy to use but it's difficult enough to use that they pay money for people to run it. So it's a good skill to have. So I recommend you do this threat hunting with Splunk. It's all extra credit. You don't, you're not required to do it, but you can replace any other projects you don't like with it. And if all you do in this course is learn how to lose Splunk, you will not have wasted your time. Splunk is wonderful. And there are a lot of jobs in it. Anyway, so that's what I wanted to show you. And looks like there's no questions. So I'm gonna stop this video and post it up.